This is filter design example number one. Design a Butterworth low pass filter using the bilinear transform. Let's walk through a general approach to the design and evaluation of this discrete time Butterworth low pass filter. Specs include 44.1 kHz system sampling frequency, 5 kHz pass bend edge, 3 dB max ripple, 10 kHz stop bend edge with minimum 25 dB loss. We're going to follow the procedure of converting a continuous time filter with the bilinear transform. In part A, we want to determine the difference equation for the low pass filter. That really means executing the design process. So we can identify the pass band frequency omega p as being a scaled version of this normalized frequency, where we take 5 kHz divided by our system sampling frequency of 44.1 kHz. That's a normalized frequency, and then we multiply that by 2 pi, and that gives us radians per sample. To apply the bilinear transform, we need to first pre-warp this frequency to calculate the continuous time passband frequency. This is capital omega p. It equals tangent of the discrete time passband frequency, little omega p, divided by 2. This has units of radians per second. We then design the continuous time transfer function for the filter. Apply the bilinear transformation by substituting s equals 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 plus z inverse. That gives us h of z. We can then translate the system function into the difference equation. In part b, we want to plot the frequency response magnitude in decibels of our design. We want to do so as a function of cyclic frequency in hertz. We do this by evaluating our system function around the unit circle. So we evaluate at z equals e to the j omega. As before, omega is going to be f divided by our sampling frequency times 2 pi. db means that we do 20 log 10, and we're working with magnitude in this case. Part c, we want to confirm the accuracy of our discrete time filter using a filter design tool, and LabVIEW has the appropriate tools for this. And in part D, we want to plot the pole zero diagram of the filter using, again, a suitable computer tool. We'll use LabVIEW for that. I do want to point out that a good plot for the pole zero diagram depends on using high precision coefficients. So make sure you use the coefficients from the filter design tool. All right, now we're ready to get into the detailed solution. There's a three-step process we'll, we will use. First, we need to identify the continuous time filter critical frequencies. To begin with, let's normalize this passband frequency of 5 kilohertz. We'll normalize that against the sampling frequency, 44.1 kilohertz. This normalized frequency is a value between 0 and 1. We can then scale that by 2 pi, and this gives us the discrete time frequency in radians per sample, 0.2268 times pi. In a similar fashion for the stop band frequency, we end up with twice this value, or 0 0.4535 times pi radians per sample. Now we need to apply the pre-warping step. This is where we invoke the portion of the bilinear transformation to get the correct continuous time equivalent frequencies. So capital omega p, that's our continuous time frequency, is tangent of the discrete time frequency for the pass band divided by 2. And this works out to the value 0 0.3721 radians per second. In a similar fashion, the stop band frequency is based on little omega s. Works out to this value, 0 0.8637 radians per second. Be using those values later on, so let me jot those down. In part two, we design the continuous time Butterworth filter transfer function. First, we need to determine the filter order. The loss function for the Butterworth filter 
evaluated at the stop and edge is this expression. Now the loss needs to be at least 25 dB. So I write this as greater than or equal to 25. Parameter epsilon is 1 for a 3 dB ripple. Next we need to work on isolating capital N. That's our filter order. Divide both sides by 10. We we'll use this as the exponent to 10, and that will undo the log 10 on the left side. Subtract 1. Now let's see how we work on this part. I'm going to first make use of the general result that a raised to the b is c. If I then take log base a of both sides, I can bring b down front. Log base a of a is simply 1. And then we can also make use of the fact that log base a can be written as log base something else that's more convenient, say 10, divided by that same log of a. It can be any base, but these are this is certainly convenient for your calculator, and you could also use natural log for the purpose. So I'll use that property then make use of this fact to write it in a more convenient log. I'm using log 10 for that. Let's bring the 2 under, underneath. Then the filter order has to be an integer. So I'll replace this statement with the inequality with the ceiling operator. That says we need to go to the next highest integer. Well, let's evaluate that for the specifics of this problem. Evaluates to 2.321. Here we have 316.2. Punch this out on the calculator. And the ceiling operator says we go to the next highest integer, which is 4. So from this calculation, we conclude that we need a fourth order Butterworth filter. Now we can refer to a table of Butterworth polynomials. For fourth order, h of s has this form. Now I'll substitute capital omega p based on what we calculated earlier. Then I'll go ahead and simplify the denominator so we can see just a single coefficient in front of each power of s. Now we have an appropriately designed transfer function in the continuous time domain. Our third step then is to convert the continuous time filter to the discrete time form with the bilinear transform. This means we replace all instances of s with 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 plus z inverse. It'd be a lot easier to use this equivalent form of z minus 1 divided by z plus 1 when you're using a computer algebra tool. And in this case, I'm going to be using Maple. I'll begin by keying in as my original input the h of s that I just found earlier. And incidentally, the blue printout here is the result of maple calculation of each step. Next, I'll evaluate h of s at this specific frequency. And just to confirm, it looks like we have nice agreement with what I was calculating earlier. All right. Now I can evaluate that result for s equals z minus 1 divided by z plus 1. This is where I'm invoking the bilinear transform. Simplify that. And uh, let's see what progress we can make here. I want to expand the polynomial on top. I'm going to say expand the numerator of my previous result divided by the denominator of my previous result. Getting pretty close. We need the leading coefficient, though, on z4, z to the fourth, to be a unit value. We need to divide the numerator and denominator by this value. I can do that this way. 
say the new numerator is the original numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. So that L cof, that would be leading coefficient. All right, that looks good. That would be my numerator, that's my denominator. This then is my system function for the discrete time filter. The only thing I have left to do here is multiply top and bottom by z inverse raised to the fourth power, and that clears this one to a one. This becomes z inverse. Here we have z inverse squared and, and so forth. This then is my discrete time filter system function h of z. And this becomes my finished result, almost. We're trying to get this into a difference equation. So the one corresponds to y of n. This would correspond to y of n minus one. Now the negative sign here translates as a positive sign. Let's see why. This expression, if we were to take the denominator and move it to the other side, and then move that piece over back to the right-hand side, that would leave us with a positive sign. So basically we translate the remaining terms. Each one of these powers of z translates into an additional delayed version of y of n. And then we also have to switch around the, the uh, positive and negative signs. This translates into the coefficient on x of n. This would be the coefficients then for x of n minus one, x of n minus two, and so on. And this is the finished result for part A. That's the difference equation. Now in part B, we want to plot the frequency response of the discrete time filter. The frequency response is the system function h of z evaluated around the unit circle. That means we evaluate at z equals e to the j omega. Now we are, want to plot the frequency response in cyclic frequency, that is, in hertz. I've talked about this a little bit already, but just to make sure it's clear, especially how the dimensionality works out on this, we normalize the frequency by dividing by the sampling frequency, and then multiply by two pi radians per cycle. You see the seconds divides out, as does cycles, and that leaves us with the discrete time frequency in radians per sample. So again, as we've done in previous parts of this problem, we take the frequency divided by the sampling frequency and multiply by two pi. Here in Maple, I'm evaluating this transfer function from the part A and doing so at e to the j omega, where capital I represents the square root of negative one. We see this result here. Probably of more interest though is what it looks like as a plot. Here I'm plotting the absolute value of the previous calculation, forming log 10 of that and then multiplying by 20 and that takes us into dB. I'm plotting from minus 10 to positive 10 kilohertz. The dB scale is running from minus 30 to zero dB. And of course this axis is frequency in hertz. Vertical axis is the magnitude of the frequency response in decibels. Let's check the specs. At five kilohertz, we need to see that it's no more than three decibels away from zero. That would be our three dB max passband ripple. So here's three dB down from zero dB. Everything looks fine meets the passband spec. Now at 10 kilohertz, we need at least 25 decibels down. Let me draw in the line for 25 dB. Then check at 10 kilohertz to see how we did. Looks like we have a four dB margin of error here. So we see the filter meets the stop band specification as well. This is the result for part B. Moving along to part C, we want to confirm the calculations in LabVIEW. 
Using two VIs from the signal processing palette, one is Butterworth coefficients that accepts the sampling frequency and the passband frequency, key in those numbers directly, and then it also needs the filter order, which we had earlier calculated as four. This sub-VI does the cascade to direct coefficients conversion, and this allows us to look at the denominator and numerator coefficients. If you're trying to find these directly, you can search for these sub-VIs by name by typing control space into LabVIEW. The front panel results look like this. Again, here's my sampling frequency, passband frequency, and filter order is four. The denominator and numerator coefficients match the earlier results from part A quite nicely. That would be the results for part C. Finally, in part D, we want to plot the pole zero diagram for the discrete time filter that we've just created. Let me extend the LabVIEW program from part C. This pole zero plotting routine accepts the numerator and denominator coefficients and creates this plot. To interpret the plot, I see the poles and the zeros right here. We actually have four zeros located out here at the maximum frequency. For reference, here's the DC point, and the highest possible frequency over here at little omega equals pi radians per sample. Now as we study this, we see that we have a lot of poles congregated around DC, and these emphasize the low frequency. All the zeros at the maximum frequency suppress high frequencies. Therefore, we see this does match the characteristics of a low-pass filter. It takes care of Part D and also takes care of this example.